with the Jewish leaders in this passage and bantering is a light word but it's going back and forth with them he said to the Jews who had believed him Jesus said if you hold to my teaching you're really my disciples then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free they answered him we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone how can you say that we shall be set free Jesus replied I tell you the truth everyone who sins is a slave to sin now a slave has no permanent place in the family but a son belongs to it forever so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessing upon your word. And just ask you, Lord, that you will just allow the power of your Holy Spirit just to change. And, and Lord, we do everything we can in our lives to, to live a good life. But, Father, that's not even good enough. And I pray, Father God, that you will transform us according to the power of your spirit and your word. And thank you for that, Father. Let us truly be those that are set free. In the name of Jesus, amen. May be seated. I've named this sermon Captivated to be Free. That's kind of an oxymoron, kind of a twist to things. But we have truly been captivated to be free. We pray, and this is one of the things that I see right now is the wrestling of what true freedom means. We watch as on the news media today where all the sexual harassment things that are going on and I am not going to address all that, even the political realm and all that, but I will tell you this, that this world and the way we define what true freedom is, is a weird way it does that. And, and to the liberal in Hollywood, it would say true freedom is to do whatever I want, whenever I want, to whomever I want. But we have found that that is not a good way to do things. That's not a good way to live life, and a society can never exist with that kind of true freedom. Or you'll find a person that kind of moves in here and they... They will go, or you look at what we call the anarchist, who would say that we need no government whatsoever, nobody telling us what to do, and whatever we want to do, whether it's dancing on top of police cars and hitting it with a, a sledgehammer or busting out windows, then the anarchy says, I am free to do whatever it is that I want to do. <clears throat> Even to the Christian, we say that I'm free to do a lot of things. Even the Paul addressed this because he says, look, I'm... I'm free, I can eat meat to idols, but is it good for me to do so? You know, he had to address this within the early church because we Christians are always great to go to Walmart and get the best deal. You know, it's not the spoiled meat, it's just the good meat still. And it was offered to idols and it was just in the marketplace in a very practical sense. But Paul says, I'm free to do all things, but is it good and expedient for me to do all things? So I, I start this because I say that freedom truly is something that comes with responsibility, even as a Christian. And freedom even has its constraints to truly be free. The person who stands up in the movie theater and shouts fire when there is no fire, they're not free to do that. They're not free to cause whatever panic they want to do and do whatever they want to do when they want to do it because our Constitution says they're free. They're not free to do that. I think even in our courts of law it says you cannot do that. You'll find yourself in however you want to define what freedom is. And different people will define it different ways. The older we get, the freer we are to do things that probably we wouldn't have done when we were young. Or when we get to be young and you think, if I ever turn 21, then I'm free. I can do whatever I want to do. You know, my mom and dad can't tell me what to do. I'll tell you something. There's even greater restraints when you turn 21. Or you have that young man that says, you know, I am so tired of living under the constraints and I want to be free and he's mad and rebellious and everything else and he goes and joins the Marines. It makes a lot of sense. So that's one way to be free. Mm -hmm. And you'll find yourself, you wish you had your mama shaking your bed, waking you up in the morning and said that drill star gets yelling, yelling at you going to get up out of that bed, boy. And you find yourself, every one of us, we look for freedom in different ways. We look for freedom from our problems. Sometimes we find that freedom in escapes, escape hatches, escape routes, and different people look for that freedom. They say, I've got to have some freedom from this issue. And so they spend a good part of their time sitting around Jack Daniels and trying to get free. Or you'll find the person that dearly wants freedom from their worries and everything, and so they go as, and stick their head in the sand as an ostrich, which proverbially really don't do that. But as they stick their head in the sand and they really try to find out there's no problems out there, you find anyone in life, and if you have the struggles of life, and you want to be free from something, everybody's got some kind of escape hatch. The Jewish people in Jesus' day, they said, if you truly want to be free, here's about a thousand regulations that you can uphold. And Jesus is looking at him and saying, look, y'all are not proclaiming what freedom, truly freedom is. 
He was looking at the Jewish people that day and he said, look, you guys are slaves. You're still a slave to your sin. And the problem is you're writing all the rules of freedom out of the context of your slavery and sin. Every one of you are captive to sin. They didn't believe that because they all had all the rules down. And as long as you're making the rules, it's kind of like Congress, as long as you're making the rules, you don't have to abide by them, then you're free. Is that right? And that's kind of what the Jewish guys were doing. They said, hey, as long as we're writing the rules and we don't necessarily have to abide by them, we just got to look good in public, then we're truly preaching what freedom is. Mm, Jesus had a different idea on this because he started looking at them and said, look, you are not really children of God. You are not even free. If you're teaching, if you're going according to my teaching, then you can be true, be, truly be free. Let me just give you this as a thought. Freedom is not to do what we want to do, but it's doing what we ought to do. Freedom truly is that heart that will produce life because it's walking in freedom. It's not a heart that's in bondage. It will always produce bondage. And if you rip the headlines out today and you see all the guys that are in bondage that are saying, I am free to do whatever I want, they're finding themselves in jail. Because in a society, even though we proclaim freedom, there are certain restrictions even on that freedom. Freedom in America is truly found in a bunch of different ways. Freedom in the kingdom of God is found in certain ways also, and we're going to talk about that. We're free to express, but we're not free to destroy. We're free to express, and that expression of freedom is that justice will always stand in the way of anarchy. Anarchy is what's produced when we decide there's all restraints are gone. I've known Christians that have walked away from biblical truths, and they find all restraints are gone, and there's this great freedom. I remember this one girl in particular we went to school with, and they thought we were just a little bit too tight in the way we had the restrictions of what the Word of God says. And I remember one day she came back to me and says, you know, you are a bondage person. You're the one that bound me up, and I, I'm free to do whatever. But I saw her life was so miserable. Because she was free to do whatever, and she was doing whatever. And you found that she was in bondage to this person or that person, and you found that she was free to do whatever. She could have no restraints on morality, no restraints on anything in life, but then she found out that that freedom was truly what bondage was all about. Freedom only works in the confines of what I say biblical truth. Just looking at what the world is looking for, they're looking for a freedom without any kind of consequences. There's no way you can produce that in this world. God's got a structure, and he's got a way he's got it placed out there in the structure we find in Scripture. The only way a democracy, a true republic, democracy, democracy is built in a republic, and America could work is because it's built in the biblical truths. You've got to have some kind of guidelines. You've got to have some kind of boundaries. Freedom in this world because, and I'll tell you this, because we are of fallen nature needs those boundaries. If we start coming up with all kinds of different ways, it would be like the guys that used to come around, and there was one particular group, and I think I was telling the men a few weeks back in the Bible study, but there was a particular group that came to Adamsville, Tennessee, and they started preaching a gospel that was totally opposite of the, the kingdom of God. One of the things they were preaching was the Pentecost was the second coming of Christ, and I was sitting there going, what? And I always despised it because we had one guy that was a Sunday school teacher that believed that, that Pentecost was the second coming of Christ, and he was teaching Sunday school, and I got there, and I was like, and he would look at me like a puppy with his eyes closed. And I would look at him like, man, you have just gulped down something as big you should never got taken hold of. And so we finally came to the conclusion that he was wrong and I was right. Not really. Um, <laughs> I wish he would have. But finally he said, I can't teach Sunday school anymore. I said, okay, that's fine. Because you're not teaching biblical truths. You're not free just to teach whatever it is you want. There are confines of those biblical truths. We just can't say, hey, you know, whatever it's today. And that group that came through teaching, they took a bunch of people captive. And they were tent-making revivalists kind of thing. And, and they came through doing that. And I looked at that and I was saying it was so confusing for those people because they said this is what God's Word says. And it was bringing freedom to them. And they would look at everybody else as if you were dumb and you couldn't figure these things out. Well, somebody that's walking in true freedom is someone that's living in the heart of what I call the outpost of the kingdom of God. And what I mean by outpost is the kingdom of God should be that little piece of heaven here on this earth. It should work just like it does in heaven. Now, there are sometimes it doesn't work that way. And I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Every church has its dysfunction. And the reason it's dysfunction is because we're here. 
There are dysfunctions in every church, but I will tell you this, the kingdom of God of righteousness, peace, and joy should produce some of the greatest freedoms in people's lives because we're walking in that righteous place with God. And Romans 14, 17 says that that is what the kingdom of God is, is righteousness, peace, and joy, and that we should pursue those things. Righteous means that right standing with God. If we're standing in right with God, that should produce some great freedom in our life. But you know what it also does? It brings some great confinements in our life. It's like one guy told me one time, and it's like the preacher said, he says, I can drink all the drink I want to and go with all the wild women I want to. It's just that God has changed my want to's because I live within the constraints of the kingdom of God. I understand the consequences of everything that goes on. What Jesus was telling the Jews that day, he says, you're still living in sin, and you're making the rules on how to be free, but you're still in sin. You've got to understand it's a heart change that's going to tru produce truly freedom. It's got heart change that makes a difference when we want to believe what the Scriptures have to say. It's that heart change that really can be sitting in the middle of the kingdom of God. Now, I got to thinking about this because I do believe that we are what I would see, and if you go back to the old Western days, and I want to take you back a little bit here, you go back in the old Western days, it is truly that outpost of that fort that's out there in a harsh land. You got to think about it. It says we're aliens and strangers that are living in this land. We're not here to set up camp and to stay here. This world as we know it and the order of this world is going to pass away. If that's shocking news to you today, go back to your scriptures and see that. He is going to take this old way of things, the sin-laid world right here, everything that's happened, and, and we think, because the humanists would say, hey, we can create something that's a utopia here. Well, they've been trying to do that for many, many, many years, and you know what? We keep ruining it as human beings because in our fallen nature, we are susceptible to captivity of our own sins. And so what God has done through his son Jesus Christ, he has set up an outpost of heaven. We call it the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is built within the parameters of the biblical truths. And if you want to hold to the biblical truths, you can live within a, a, a great amount of freedom. I was thinking how would I describe this even in, in nowadays vernacular, but in past times. For those who aren't old enough, you have to go back to uh, whatever the, the what, I forget what even channel it's on, but the Bonanza. It's on the channel. You can go back and watch it. For those who aren't old enough to figure out what Bonanza is, Lifetime, different things. It's on, it's on the old channels. We got to watching those things. The boys like watching Ponderosa, and, and the worst thing you can do is get engaged to one of the boys on the Ponderosa because you're going to be dead before the episode's over. I had to spoil it for them. I said, she ain't going to live, son. She is not going to live. <laughs> She's going to die. Don't, don't fall in love with little Joe. You're going to die in a gunfight. You didn't mean to. Anyway, anyway, Ponderosa, I started thinking about that because here is Jesus, and he's walking along here, and he's talking to the Jews. He said, look, you're, you're missing the point here. You're not living in this place that you think you're supposed to, you, you got. You got this freedom and stuff. And so just think back to the Ponderosa. You had Paul living there, and he had this widespread Ponderosa, and it was a wonderful place to live. And they knew exactly where the Ponderosa's limits were because anytime somebody tried to edge onto the Ponderosa, they'd always find them. And you'd had several times people would try to sit there and live within the Ponderosa, and they didn't belong. And so you'd have Adam, because he was a tough guy in black. You'd have Adam ride out with the legal sense. Then you'd have Hoss to ride out and say, look, I will move you if I have to. And then you had little Joe to show up, and it was just hot about everything. I love the days of Ponderosa. It's pretty simple. You go back and watch those now. They, they took on a lot of social things that were going on during the day. They did. And they're, they're themes and stuff that ran through that. But I see most of us, as we look and we see the Ponderosa, this is the outpost, and it was built in Nevada. It was out there in Virginia City, and it was around there. But you knew there was parameters around this Ponderosa. And in that Ponderosa, you could live happily because all the resources you ever needed was at the Ponderosa. You had all the cattle you needed, had all everything you could imagine, had everything that could go on. There was just perfect life to live right there on the Ponderosa. And you'd see some of those views that were pretty awesome. That was where true freedom is found. But you know, the funny thing is, they, they talked about going out and mending fences, but you really never saw fences around Ponderosa because that spread was thousands upon thousands, if not millions of acres. When God calls us to the kingdom of God, it is like living in a place of an outpost. It is living in a place, and there are parameters on the Ponderosa, just like there are parameters in the kingdom of God, but it's not really fenced off to keep us out or keep anybody in or keep anybody out. But there are true parameters that are there. You can be in that, that Ponderosa, and you can know here's where it stretches out to, and it's kind of like what we used to do around here. If you want to know the, the limitations of boundaries around here, you, you go over that old oak tree is where it goes, and it goes down here to this fence post, and that's kind of the way it goes. But here's where the kingdom of God differs a little bit. Jesus said to the, the Jews of that day, he says, if you want to be free, you've got to live within these biblical truths of my teaching. 
And those biblical truths are pretty good outline. Now, what the Jews had done, they had put up fences everywhere. They said, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can do this, you can't do that. And if you do all these things, walk in the right way, do the right thing, then you can truly be free to do whatever you want to do. But you never could measure up because every time you think you're measuring up, they'd put another rule on there. Here's what I have found in my life, and here's what I have found in this captivated to be free part, is that we live in this kingdom of God. It is the realm in which God truly grants the greatest amount of freedom. But that freedom is only found in the constraints of his word. I wish I could tell you there was some other way to do this, but I will tell you this. Think about heaven. Next time you think about heaven, and, and, and if you really think about it, think about your own life and how it fits in heaven even right now. How would what we do here right now fit in heaven? Now, this old adage of that person standing over in the corner crying after he first got to heaven because he was missing his favorite TV show the first week. Or we have that thing that we think if heaven's going to be like that we're all going to be doing uh, Alabama football or Auburn football. We won't be doing that. Uh, there won't be any concussions in heaven. And I really wouldn't want to line up against an angel. You know what I mean? But I have found this. That heaven is something that if we think about really clearly, because everybody gets to go to heaven no matter how, well, you have to, you're really bad. I've done a lot of funerals, and there are a few people, that nobody will say, well, they're, they're in heaven. I've done a few of those. And they won't, nobody at the funeral would say, well, they're in heaven. Everybody's going, I sure hope he made it. And I'm going, why? You didn't want to live around him here. He said, that's kind of harsh, isn't it, preacher? But I'm telling you, heaven is not just a place of, constraint that everybody gets to go and we all there this prelim that we're living in this kingdom of god is to get us used to something for all eternity what god's outpost of what i call the ponderosa the kingdom of god here he's saying look it's wide open but at the same time there are limitations of what we can do in this life and it's not in order to take anything good from us but it's to keep the bad from happening you know, when he tells us to give up those things that wound us the worst, and what happens is that when we get wounded in life and God says, you can't keep that unforgiveness. I think, well, that's kind of unfair. That person harmed me, and so it's so bad he harmed me. I will tell you this. There is no revenge in heaven. Hmm. Because you hate them here, you're going to get to carry that to heaven. You know, you're dragging this into the pearly gates, and you're going, I got all these people I hate, and I got an agenda, God. I'm going to bring it on in here, and I got this agenda, and I'm going to tell you what. We're going to work on this over eternity. You know, Joe over here did this to me. I want to tell you what. I want the trap door to fall out and him go straight to Hades. Now, this is where that gets a little squirrely because you're standing outside the pearly gate. God says, you want to dump that out there? No. Well, that six-inch drop that I believe is there, there's a little six-inch drop. And all of a sudden, that thing jumps. Kind of like when you're on the elevator and does that little jump, and you get scared. Then God will look at you. Do you really want to get rid of that now? Yes, sir. I would love to get rid of all this stuff, not bring it into heaven. I think that six-inch drop is going to do away with a lot of our bitterness and hurt and pain and all that stuff. Because we think when Jesus tells us, says, you've got to get rid of these things. That's why you live on the Ponderosa and true freedom is that these things do not belong in the kingdom of God. And I look at these things and I kind of go, Lord, to have true freedom means that I've got to get rid of this sin nature that's in me that wants to hold on to that stuff. I want to hold on to sin. I want to do these things. And God's saying, look, I've changed your want to's. But if you want to live on the edge of the kingdom of God, and this is where I hate to say it today in our cultural Christianity, we live on the edge of the kingdom of God. We want to belong one foot to the Ponderosa and say, I belong here, and that if I ever get in trouble, they'll all come running. Hoss, little joy, and Adam, and even Candy will come. They'll come running and help me because I'm on the Ponderosa with one foot. But then we live one foot here and saying, but you know what? It's a lot of fun to live right here. Pilgrim's Progress was a great book, and it was one of those, if you want to read, it has so many allegories and illustrations of different things and you get in a slew of despondency and different stuff because outside of the parameters of where we're the kingdom of god there's a lot of things that happen right out there you can look at that and you say well it's not going to hurt too bad i'm in the kingdom and jesus says i want to tell you something one of those jumps and he's trying to tell the jewish people says you're still a slave to sin 
The way we know we're in the kingdom of God is our want to's really change. Does that mean you'll never sin again? No. What it does mean is that there's a heart of repentance that takes place. Ah, oh, I hate when I do that. God, oh, I can't believe that. I am so sorry, God. You know, and, and I guess the tragedy, because I've seen people, and they have done that jump so many times. I, and you're kind of going... And you know what? It gets so hard to get back. And it's not until a brother or sister comes to you. And when you get three or four steps out here, Ponderosa's in sight. The kingdom of God is there. I can come back anytime I want to because there's an open door. And that song Jamie sang at the beginning, beautiful. I've always loved you because that's true. And God is beckoning us to come back and live within the realm of the kingdom of God. But here's where we think I'm truly free to do whatever I want. But yes, you are. And here's the love of God I don't understand. I really do not understand that. How he could love me so much to let me have a choice. I, I don't understand that love. I, I don't even love my sons that much. You say, well, they're older. They, I, I still, but I try to influence their choices. I make no bones about it. I still look at it as a daddy, just like my heavenly father. He tries to influence my choices. That's why when Jesus tells him, he said, if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, he's got you set right in the heart. And this is where God wants us to live, right in the heart of the kingdom of God, not on the peripheral edge, because we're all the time looking, saying, boy, if I could just do this. How many times have we seen, some of us are older, you don't think about it as much anymore when you're young. Boy, if I could just do this, then that would be fun to do that for a little while. The college-age kid says, look, we're going to party our way through these four years, and then we're going back to normality. I'll tell you something. You never get back to normality. You lose something out there. You say, well, it's a new norm. Yes, it is. It is a new norm that happens. I saw where a young lady had posted that she was losing her innocence for millions of dollars. And I'm sitting there going, she said, it's my choice. And I'm going, what? How do you do those things? Because she's free to do whatever she wants. It's her choice. And she says, there are no consequences according to the world. There's no consequences whatsoever. The world says there's no consequences. If I'm free to do whatever I want, and Jesus is looking at these Jewish people and saying, you've got some great rules and stuff, but what you have missed is your heart hasn't changed. Your heart's got to change. To live in the midst of the kingdom of God, to live on the Ponderosa, you've got to have your want to changed. And see, you know, the funny thing is, and this is what I always find even on the Ponderosa with Ben and, and uh, having Joe and Hoss and all those guys, they never wanted to leave the Ponderosa. They really didn't. Had a lot of people came in. That was a setting up. Never wanted to leave. Virginia City was fun to go see, but we're going home to the Ponderosa. And you know, I believe if God truly has saved our hearts, we have this great desire in us to live in the middle of the kingdom of God. That means where we're living that righteous life, where we're living in that place where we're wanting to please God. That's what righteousness is, is a right standing with God. It's a want to change. Then we have some of the greatest peace that you can imagine because living in that place of the kingdom of God means that God is going to give you peace because you know his word is true. And his word's going to come true for you. And you're like, well, it's kind of hard. It's kind of, I don't understand how some things don't happen. But listen, outside of that kingdom, here's what happens. And I call it the anarchy of the enemy. He will always offer you that false freedom. He's not allowed on the land. There's not a fence to keep you in. It's wide open. But what he is in his, what he tries to do is he leans in and says, look, See that person over there? Look what they're getting. You're not getting that. God doesn't like you. You see that person? They're being so blessed over here. And they're just living out in the world. They're just living in that place of just, you know. I, I can tell you as a preacher, I look at some preachers and I'm going, how in the world does that church grow? I can tell you as a preacher, I, have to, I deal with it. I'm going, I know that guy. You know, I know him behind the scenes. I'm going, how in the world? It does. And I'm sitting there going, but, but what I look at is where the anarchist, he leans over into that place where you're living in the kingdom. He leans over and says, hey, God's jipping you. I mean, we've got the whole Ponderosa over here. You've got the blessings of God that you'll walk in. And yeah, there's some restriction in it. And you look at this person over, he's not walking in any kind of restriction. He's kind of over there going, whatever. They're the ones that get everything. I mean, they, they take it and slap somebody back that slaps them. You're going, that isn't fair, God. And there ain't no punishment for them. And you're sitting there going, and God's saying, look, in my kingdom, 
It's where great peace is. It's where great joy is. I always remember when Hoss and little Joe, they go to different towns and they get in trouble because for whatever reason, everybody liked to arrest a Cartwright. Because they were living outside that realm of the Ponderosa. There was always a beckoning back. And you know what? I loved it because anytime one of them got in trouble, got thrown in jail in some other place, some other town, here come the Ponderosa and all the help of it. And I also loved it when Ben showed up because he had that magical voice when he says, okay, you're going to let my boy go. I kind of picture it as a God type. Because if we live in the kingdom of God, we have full protection, full rank of here. The anarchists will always lean over into a territory of the Ponderosa and say, hey, it's more fun over here. That's just like the prodigal when he listened to that voice and he went off and he ended up in the pigs. You remember that story? That's another Ponderosa story. He thought, well, if I, I truly have freedom, I can get away from my father. I can get away from his restrictions. I can live my life however I want to live it. Woo. That's one of the ways you go, slippery slide, and I was sinking deep in my sin, far from the peaceful shore. Whee! Went on down. The anarchy of the enemy will always offer us what's called the false freedom. The anarchy of the enemy will also want to bring chaos. And see, this is where you go back in Genesis. You said God created out of the chaos, out of the disorder, he created order. His kingdom is a kingdom of order. But that order is only there if we're walking in that truth. And this is when Jesus is saying, he says, I will tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Everyone has a problem. Every one of us sitting here has got a problem. The problem is, is a sin that holds our heart captive. The only way we can get free of that is to have that belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son who belongs to it belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. What he is saying, he's got an offer. He says, if you want to live on the heavenly Ponderosa, he says, you get all the benefits of this. Yes, there are some restraints because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that offers us up, and the anarchy is always speaking at, into the Ponderosa. He's always speaking into the kingdom saying, look, you can have all this. This is what it's worth. This is what you can have. And we've got to listen to the voice of God and not to the voice of our enemy. We find ourselves because he'll always take us. The next thing you know, you're in some kind of quicksand somewhere that you didn't even know about it, but God already knew. He went on to tell them, says, you are descendants of Abraham, but says, you're missing the whole point. You're not living in this kingdom of righteousness. You're not in right standing with God because you got sin in your heart. And because you got sin in your heart, you will never have peace. And because there is no peace, you cannot have joy. To live in the kingdom of God means that we're going to live in that place of true freedom. In 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, Apostle Paul is reminding the church there was things he would remind them of, and that was things that he sh they should and should not be doing. Now, a lot of times people say, well, you don't want to get into what would be the legalism of everything. It's not legalism, folks, but I will tell you this. When God tells me I'm to love my enemy, that's not legalism. That's the truth that can set me free. That's not something that I have to do. It's something I choose to do because I live within the kingdom of God. Because I know that is his heart. Because he loved me when I hated him. He says to represent the kingdom as an ambassador, according to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, means that wherever I go, and that's what I always loved about the Ponderosa, they could go to a town across the country, and they say, I'm from the Ponderosa, and they go, oh. Like everybody knew. Everybody knew Ponderosa. And I love it because you can say, hey, I'm from the kingdom of God. I am saved, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know, if you're walking in that, all the resources of heaven is there at your disposal. You know what? The anarchists will always promise you. He said, look, if you're walking this freedom, I'll give you everything, the world and everything else, like he did for Jesus. Remember when he took him to those places and said, hey, I'll give you this world, I'll give you this kingdom, I'll give you all this, turn the stone. But Jesus says, no, 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 I won't do these things. Because my kingdom is a kingdom that's not of this world, but we can live in this outpost called the kingdom of God, which Jesus established. So let me tell you this. This is one when the Apostle Paul, he's telling the church there in 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, he says, you have been bought with a price. For every one of us has sinned. You know what? Your soul will die. That's the bad news. The good news is every one of us has sinned. We have redemption in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the invitation. This is why it's so important at the cross. You got people out there right now who believe their true freedom is in the bottom of a bottle. Their true freedom may be in uh, some kind of dope or something that's going on in their lives. Maybe their true freedom is in their sexual uh, lasciviousness and everything that goes on. Maybe their true freedom is in I can do whatever I want to whenever I want to. I don't need God. I've come across people like that, folks, and there's nothing worse. It's like Seth and I, we were out there doing a little fundraiser at Chick-fil-A, selling the calendars and stuff, and I was out there doing these, the calendars, telling Jesse, I was out there doing these calendars, and we're going through the drive there, and I was trying to get Seth 
getting a young man to do this and, and, and do it with a smile because I said, you can sell on your cuteness. I have to rely on funny, okay, and, and fast, funny and fast talk. And so I was sitting there telling them, I said, I was telling all these people about, the, you really want these calendars. Everybody wants one of these calendars. And as you go out there, and I was telling Seth, I said, it's no different than evangelism. All we got to do is present this calendar. I said, if they reject the calendar, don't worry about it. They're not rejecting you, son. I said, there's the next car coming. You know, don't go away with your head down. There's the next car coming. And I had several people say, you ought to be in sales. I said, I am. And I said, I, said, I love what I do. Because I believe that we present the gospel. We present this kingdom of God. And as we present this truth, it says everybody is invited to this outpost of heaven called the kingdom of God. And until we get to heaven, we, those of us here, need to live within the truth, the biblical truths. Does it produce constraints in our life? Yes. Why is that important? Because when you lived as, let's just say, as you lived as a cartwright, there were certain standards you had to live to. You're a cartwright, son. I want to tell you something. You're a child of God living in the kingdom of God. Act like it. Walk in that truth where the freedom of God is there. And when you got this, somebody that does offense to you, you forgive them. And they're going, why did you do that? Because they're living under the anarchist out here that tells them they're supposed to slap you when you get slapped. Why do you do that? Because, not because you're a cartwright, because I'm a child of God. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and Jesus has set me free. yes. I used to be that, but let me tell you what I am now. I once was lost, now I'm found. I was not saved, now I'm saved. Here's what a saved life does, because it's the kingdom of God, the outpost of the, God, the, the heavenly kingdom, and that outpost that we live in called the kingdom, that is preparing us for all eternity. I challenge you, each one of you, and challenge myself. Think about our own life and how we live it. The attitudes we have towards our family, the actions we take towards the people around us. If it's a shame in heaven, this outpost called the kingdom of God, it's a shame in it too. How do we get out of that? How, God is not going to kick you off the Ponderosa, but if you're living with this one foot in, one foot out, you're living right on the, the line there, God's saying, look, the Son will set you free. His Word will set you free. There are times that we've got to hear the voice of God, and God said, look, this is not right. Whereas, it, it, you know, I, there are certain things that are cut and dry and you see in Scripture. And there are certain things we try to wrestle out and say, they're not as cut and dry, but they are cut and dry. And I find it in Scripture, and when I see this, that I've been bought with a price. I am reminded of that when I start edging towards, and I start looking over, because on that mountainside where you're looking outside the Ponderosa, the outpost of the kingdom of God, and you're looking over going, saying, you know, it's not so bad. I don't know if it's going to be that big of a trap. Then you hear that voice of God that says, no. Or you see the reminder of the prodigal son of that truth that he walked away from everything and, and his father was always there waiting. But you find yourself have been bought with a price. We got to live as if we've been bought with a price. Secondly, we got to live as if we love Jesus with everything that's in us. The Jewish people couldn't do that of that day. The Jewish leaders of that day couldn't say. They said there were some believers that would hold to his teaching. That meant they lived in the outpost of the kingdom of God, waiting for that one day when they get to see Jesus. And you find yourself that everything, if we're going to heaven, I want us to be so comfortable with heaven here and now and not be shocked when we get there. And I've told people this before, those that have the racist attitude and the hatred towards those of other skin, I'll tell you something. I always, I'm calling myself semi-white these days because people say, what are you? I'm semi-white. I like keep everybody guessing. So Indian and all the other mixes in me. And I tell folks this, but I've told people this. I said, if you don't like someone of a different color in this earth, and you think you're going to get to heaven, let me tell you what your heavenly existence is going to be. We've got garden homes there. We don't have palatial, you know, and you think, well, I've got this, this mansion on the hillside that I don't have to see anybody. I want to tell you something. We're going to rub elbows with everybody every day. You don't like people here, guess what? You won't like heaven. If you don't like somebody of some different color, let me tell you something. When you open up your, your door and your shutters on that first day in heaven and you say, good morning, it is that one that you hate the worst that's going to be going, good morning, ha! If God's got a sense of humor. If you think you make it, if you make it, I say that, if you make it. Because I'm not sure if we have that kind of hatred in our heart with the white supremacists and all that stuff. They can say they're a Christian all day long, but you've got that kind of hatred in your heart, you need to repent. The black supremacists, too, need to repent. Because that isn't going to go into heaven. Now I look at this, and what God wants us to proclaim is a freedom. 
Here's my last thoughts to you. Those people that we have listed on this right here, there are seven, several that are probably held captive. There are people that are listed here that need to know Jesus Christ. One of the best things that you can do is to live your kingdom purpose out, everything that God's calling you. You've got to live within the realm. You, cannot, you will never convince a soul on here if you're living one foot in, one foot out. You'll never convince a soul that Jesus Christ can save them because they look at your life and they're confused. It's more important that we live in the heart of the kingdom of God, that we live according to his biblical truths. If they see you and how you live your life and if, if you cheat, if you steal, if you lie, you do all these things, but you go to church on Sunday, they won't know part of that. I can tell you that right now. One of the greatest stumbling blocks is a Christian that's living on the outer edge of the kingdom of God. Outer edge, not inside even. That's one of the greatest stumbling blocks I've seen. And one thing I want you to know is that if we're living in this kingdom of God, we're not just living there for ourselves, we're living for others. We live in this freedom. We are captivated by God's love, driven by God's love, and that captivation produces His grace. His grace is what motivates us to want to do what is right. I will ask you this. Do you need a want to change in your life? The challenge is, do you see something in Scripture, maybe you can pick anything. You can say giving, you can say forgiving, you can say mercy given, you, anything. Pick anything. God can change you want to. I don't really want to forgive that person. You don't understand what they did to me. He can change your want to. There are certain things we can talk about about that. Don't just think everything's carte blanche. We can talk through some things. But there's a truth that you hold on to in Scripture that sets you free. You know that revelation that the uh, prodigal son, if you've ever been around a pig pen, I have. There's nothing worse than living in one, having to feed the pigs. But that revelation he came to, he says, look, my father's servants eat better than this. And they live better than this. I'll go back and be my father's servant. His father would hear nothing of that. But that was a truth that transformed his life. Any of us, and if you remember what it was like before you got saved, there was a truth that transformed somewhere in there. Somebody said something or the word of God was spoken to you that transformed you. And no longer did you want to live there, but you wanted to be in the middle of the kingdom of God. And sometimes that comes with tears and sorrow. But what I have found in my life to walk in true freedom is a choice that I make to hear the voice of God and God's word speaking daily. I can choose not to. I really can. Every one of us can. But true freedom is found in what Jesus said. Those who believe me at my word. He said, if the Son has set you free, you are going to be free indeed. And I will say this. Free to do what we ought, not just what we want. Man, I need that. There are people I don't really like, if I confess that to you. There are people I struggle with, even as a pastor. You say, you're supposed to be next to perfect. No, I'm not. There are times that I don't want to do something right, and God says you've got to do right. And I don't really do it for you. I want to do it for him. It helps to do it for you guys too, but I want to do it for him. That's where the change of true freedom is, that I choose to do what I ought because of the power of his word and his spirit speaking. He told the Jews, he says, you'll always be a slave. And I said, we've never been a slave. No, you are a slave. Years ago, it's like the bond servant becomes from a slave to the rights of a son. You could choose to do that. If you no longer wanted to be a slave, but you wanted to live under the confines of that master, you could go to him and say, look, pierce my ear. I'll be known as yours. Folks, he has pierced our heart with his love we should be known as his ponderosa is yours until we get to heaven everything's going to be good in heaven but let's act like it while we're living in this kingdom outpost and show the world there are people that are dying to see this it's our responsibility to share it with them let's pray together father i just thank you that you allow the power of your holy spirit in this place lord Show us that we are not living for ourselves. No longer we are in this outpost called the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of heaven that you have planted here on this earth through your truths, through who you are, and because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 
you invite us to have a changed life living within the confines of this kingdom of heaven. And Lord, it's not a constraint that takes anything from us. It is the confines of your grace that empowers us to live what true life is. We thank you for that. We thank you that you've given us a new name in heaven. We'll know, be known by. We thank you, Father, that while we're here on this earth, we are to be your witness, your testimony, as alien strangers walking through this land in the outpost of the heavenly kingdom of God to proclaim you till you come. So, Father, let us be those that walk in your freedom. And, Lord, when the anarchists cries out to us and tells us, it's great over here, let us listen to your voice and not be deceived by the wolf that will always come to destroy. And, Father, I pray that you will grant us your grace. You have given us your mercy, which is new every day. But grant us your grace to empower us to live in this kingdom outpost where we are your witness and for everyone we have listed on this cross our influence of that witness can be transformative for them we thank you for that Lord save us from ourselves mostly Lord redeem us in your truth of your word in the name of Jesus let's stand as we sing our closing hymn if you have a prayer need personally this morning Maybe it's a want to change or something. We're going to sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. We're not going to take long. But if you'll sing with us, then if you have a prayer need this morning, we need to pray for anything specific in your life. Maybe something the enemy's holding on or maybe something that you need to just give up to the Lord today. You don't even have to tell me. You can just come and say, I want a prayer. Yeah, sure, sure. Let me get a microphone. This has just been burning in my heart ever since Donnie stood up there and said, how long do we keep doing this? And I know that, I said, every name on that cross is burning in someone's heart. And I've watched, you know, as people, a lot of times it's the same people that come up week after week and they're either clinging to the cross or on their knees praying for someone. And I just wanted to encourage you to not give up those prayers I was in that situation where I was praying I was fighting the enemy for my son Matt who you all know Matt and I knew I knew I'm not going to share anything that he would not tell you himself you know but Matt had walked away from his first love he had gone out into the darkness and I cried and I spent so much time fighting those forces of darkness through prayer on his behalf. And I knew that I was not the one that was going to be able to draw him back. I was mama. I was not the one. So my prayer was, God, please, you know what's burning in Matt's heart. You know what it's going to take to draw him back. Please put a person in his life that is going to speak what he needs to hear that will draw him back to you. He did just that with the simple word of go to Guatemala with us. That's what was burning in Matt's heart. That's what he needed. I look around and I do not like it when I don't see my son in church, but today... My son is preaching in a pulpit in another church. So do not forsake your prayers. God is hearing them, and he is working even when you don't see it. Like my bracelet said, with God, all things are possible. Awesome, Sandy. Appreciate it. If you have prayer this morning, I invite you to come. Personal prayer or public prayer. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. 
I want to see you, yes, Lord. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 sing holy, we sing holy, 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 I want to see you, I want to see you, I want to see you. Let's go forth here and live in the freedom that Christ has granted us. And that freedom is found through the power of His Holy Spirit grounded in His Word. The majesty of His love towards us is that majesty we are to proclaim and declare until He comes. That's a love that we don't quite understand, but it's a love that the world is yearning for. So go forth as His disciples. Go forth as His witness. As the outpost of heaven, we live in this kingdom, proclaim His righteousness, live in His peace, and walk in the joy that He gives you. In the name of Jesus, amen.